Gentlemen, welcome to the Front Row Dads podcast. I'm your host, John Roman. If you're here for the first time, this is the show for family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. And if you are returning, if you have been a loyal, longtime listener, I am so grateful for your contributions and helping the brotherhood to expand. Uh, the show is growing, our membership is growing, and it's because of incredible members that we have, like one of the guys that's with us today, Seth Daly. But it is not just Seth. Seth is joined by his beautiful wife, his incredible daughter, and in spirit, the rest of his family. <laughs> now, I have to tell you guys that I met the Daly family years ago. I believe it was at a Best Year Ever event. I could be wrong. Was it was one it, life. Was it One Life? It was One yeah. Life Fully Lived, led by a mutual friend, an incredible human, Tim Rode, and many others that were involved in that project. Um, and then we would continue to show up and, and be in the same places for events like Best Year Ever Blueprint that was hosted by uh, Hal Elrod and John Berghoff. And what happened over the years was an unfolding of a beautiful friendship, a beautiful community coming together. Uh, and the Daly family coming from from Baltimore back to or over to Austin, and then now we're hanging out and we're spending time together, and it's really incredible. We just wanted and, to be like you guys. Well, we w all wanted to be like something, which is why we navigated to Austin, right? We we all That's felt true. the pull, no doubt. And so here we are, and we've spent some incredible days together. Uh, we have recently at your home, you opened up your beautiful home and you just, you have your, you have the heart of hosts, right? You just take care of people. You, you nurture people, you bring them in. And I know that you all love and value and appreciate community. Uh, I want to compliment the two of you, Seth and Alice for your incredible children, which is one of the reasons we're talking today because of uh, the type of parenting that you have done over the years that has resulted in kids that people can't stop talking about. <laughs> they want to hire them. They want to bring them into their families. They want to surround, like, we just, it's like a magnetic pull to the daily children. And uh, it's like, you're, you're cool if you know the daily kids. That's uh, how it feels. <laughs> so guys, I'm really looking forward to this. We're talking about Alice, your new book is out, but really I want to talk about the Daily Family and which is which is part of the story of the book and we'll get there but let's begin at the be let's begin at the beginning. So Alice and Seth, here's a question that you didn't see coming. Tell us your love story real quick. How did you two meet? Oh my gosh. We haven't told this in a while. Um, we met in college, so I'm from Baltimore. Seth is from uh, Bozeman, Montana, and we met in Chicago, out of all places, kind of in the middle. And uh, we were uh, we were in a band together. Yeah, so Christian college. So you'd call it a worship team at a Christian college, yeah. but drums. And I sang, and I led the led the little shenanigans of the band. There were 14 of us, if you can imagine that. That's so Fun cool. fact, Alice was a better singer than I was a drummer. Uh, so in college, one of the dates was we went to a game for the White Sox uh, back when they were, I guess, not so great, right? They've had seasons, but went to a White Sox game, got to go out on the field. You know how you get to go on the field at a White Sox game, John? You know how you do that? It's if if your partner is singing the national anthem. So I'll sing the national no anthem. No way. And uh, yeah, so there That's so cool. Now I feel like, why, why is there not karaoke at your parties when we're over there? <laughs> there's a totally good reason why there's not karaoke. That'd be the quickest way to lose Alice at an event would be uh, karaoke. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a fun story. I, I love that so much. Carissa, welcome to the call. Thank you. This is the first time we've done a family interview like this. So, um, and you're yeah, well, there's a family to trailblaze. It's us. That's right. And you're are you are you in Austin now? Or are you zooming in from I'm in somewhere Tulsa, else? Oklahoma still. So I am calling in from Tulsa. That's awesome. Now tell us a little bit about you, Carissa. Tell us what you're doing right now and why you're in Oklahoma. Give us a little a quick tour. Well, I never thought I would live in Oklahoma ever. And at the beginning of the year, I uh, decided, well, when I graduated high school last year, I decided I wasn't going to go 
the tra traditional college route. And so I started applying to all of these apprenticeships pretty much all over the country and wasn't expecting to move to Tulsa. And from the day I started interviewing to the day I got hired at a church in Tulsa was about eight weeks. I ended up moving to Tulsa really quickly in March. Um, and I've been here ever since. And now I'm just living my best life and exploring all the new opportunities and jumping in and just figuring out what's next. Carissa, let's get honest here. What was it like growing up in the daily household. Tell us about your mom and dad. Tell us all the things. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was so different. I think from everyone else I've ever met, um, we, I mean, it was just absolutely different. We never did things the traditional conventional way. Um, I remember being 14 years old in my freshman year of high school and having to go to the principal's office to tell them I was going to take four days to go to Tony Robbins UPW and do the firewalk. And my principal was like, yeah, you're not allowed to miss school. And I was like, well, it's happening. So you can't like I'm leaving. <laughs> um, and from that day forward, um, I really feel like that was the catalyst to the unconventional life that we started living. Um, but we never did things normally. I grew up learning the ins and outs of the family business and real estate. So my birthday party being right around Labor Day, we'd have giant parties at our house. I got used to the 400 people at our house celebrating my birthday with me. And that's what I thought was normal, um, hosting the parties and uh, just learning how to meet new people and just learning how to network and how to go up to adults and have conversations at 10 years old, just things nice. that most kids don't learn. Um, and that was just normal for us. What would you yeah. say in your opinion, Carissa, would be your family's values? Like if you had to pick two or three, your family brand, right? How you felt about your family, what would that be? I would say that we're trailblazers who aren't afraid of taking the road less traveled. Um, we are adventurous. Um, we're always gonna say yes to trying things at least once. You don't have to like it, but you're gonna try it. Um, and I think we have a passion for learning new things that um, is like you can see through all of all six of us. It's not just the adults in the family. I think all of us have a passion for learning and teaching and just growing ourselves. Mm, that I, I that's how I see your family is uh, such learners, so curious, uh, just constant and never ending improvement, uh, always showing up to the next event, always, you know, interested to better yourself so that I, my sense is that you can provide to the community, that you can be of service to the community in the ways that you're, you're gifted to do so. Yeah. Alice, um, you know, what sparked this conversation here today is that you wrote an amazing book and, um, yeah, and are we, are we gonna, yeah, there it is magic mom holding it up. Um, I'm so happy for you. And I'm so happy for all those that will get to read it. And so a question that might be popping up for listeners right now is, wait a minute, this was the Front Row Dads podcast. Why are we talking about the magic mom? And here's why we are. Because in order to be a great dad, you must be interested in mom. You must be interested in what your partner is doing and how they view the world and how your children interact with mom. And that's why, you know, interestingly, and I don't know if you, if any of you know this, but 25% of our listeners of this show are women. Oh, wow. and I was shocked to hear that, that, you know, people would reach out to me and say, I've been listening to your show. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a show for dads. What's they're like, oh, it helps me get an incredible perspective that I don't normally get. So I think that if we flip the script a little bit here and we talk about your book, Alice, and we, we can learn about the things that you've done, your approach to, to being mom. And, and, of, and of course, um, you know, we wanted to have Seth and Carissa as part of this too, to expand the narrative and talk about their perspectives behind all this. But tell me, go back to the origin, if you would, Alice, and tell me about the start or the spark of the book. Yeah. So, well, one, I can understand why women listen to the podcast. I know that I do. Um, yeah. because 
Well, it's, you know, family men with businesses. It's like, okay, well, what about the family? And, you know, we want to know what's going on with, with the dads and, yes. you know, what you guys are learning. And as moms there, are, I don't think there are as many outlets if you're not in the professional world to get the information that you guys get. So I do work outside of the home. I do, you know, a whole bunch of stuff where I get all that good stuff in, but I don't think all moms do. And so I think this is a really great vehicle for that. And I wanted to perpetuate that. So the funny thing about the book is that I wrote it with one intent. And as, you know, it kind of progressed, I realized, oh my gosh, this is actually a personal growth book for moms disguised as a parenting book, because you can't actually parent without addressing the person in the mirror first. And for most of us as adults, like after you finish school, there's no formal learning. And so if you don't take that initiative to go learn and to grow, it just stops. And so there's a lot of 21 year olds that might as well be 95 because they're, they're, they're no longer growing. So how do we, how do we get information into the hands of moms that will help them and then also then translate to our kids because I mean who doesn't want for for their kids to be happier and to um have more than than what we have I mean we all feel this responsibility to give them more so the magic mom actually came after I got um burned out in real estate like I've been selling real estate for 15 16 years at the time and I was tired and I was crispy, like it was not, it was not fun to be around me. And I literally got to the point where I was like, I just stopped showing up one day. I just like, like I, I'm not coming in. It was not, it was not good. Before they invented quiet quitting. I, uh, yeah. I might have been I, a trailblazer yeah, there. Who knows? Yeah, I should have, I should have coined a term then. Um, <laughs> because I knew that there was something more. I knew there was something next. And I kept like, well, I'm just going to keep working until I figure out what that next thing is. And at first I thought it was going to be opening an act in and, and I, you know, I was like, I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm going to keep working until I figure it out. But what I didn't realize, it's more like a trapeze. In order to catch the next one, you actually have to let go of one. Yeah. And you need that white space in the middle where it feels like you're actually falling before you can grab the next thing. Because I didn't have enough margin in my life to even think about what would be next. Like my life didn't have that in it. I thought for somehow like by powering through, somehow it was going to come to me. And it, it can't come if there's not that white space. But once I created that white space and I would do things like, you know, self-care, which I thought self-care is for other people. Like I don't need self-care. Like I'm good. Um, like I went and started getting massages and going to the chiropractor and started taking care of myself. I'm like, I remember at first I would go and it would be like, I don't even know why I'm getting this massage. This doesn't feel good. I've got 97 things to do. Like my head was just spinning, but as I started to like, okay, just, just go with it. It was actually in that space that a lot of the ideas for the book came and in listening to podcasts and asking different questions and the question I would pose to listeners is, you know, if you're in that feeling of stuck space, or I don't know what my purpose is, what's the question that people ask you the most that they, they keep coming to you with this question and the answers roll off your tongue so effortlessly. You're like, mm -hmm. doesn't everybody know this answer? And as I started to explore that question, the question I got most often when we would travel, we'd speak, we'd everywhere. The question was, hey, how do you guys have four girls that are like, actually really cool and curious and kind and adventurous. And they have this entrepreneurial spirit. I'm like, well, that's easy. So that's how the book came to be. And the magic mom, magic is an acronym for model, affirm, grace, inquire, and coach. So five principles to raise entrepreneurial. And I say daughters, cause we have four daughters, um, but they're principles. So they work for everybody. So if you have boys, if you don't have kids, they all still work. Mm. Hey, on that first note of modeling, um, and I'm so glad you went there because my question was going to be, what's the question that people kept asking you, right? So that's perfect. Seth, um, you know, when you when you think about what Alice has modeled to the girls over the years, what do you see that you respect, that you appreciate, that you love about your wife and what she has demonstrated, not just talked about? So, geez, all right, where to start? Um, here's what I'm most present to right now is that there, there is modeling the world in like this, the, the Facebook uh, role of um, everything that's going great in your world. 
well, I, I suppose now there's people on Facebook and Instagram that are, you know, sharing everything that's going terrible as well. But what I, what I've watched Alice do is model for the girls, the journey of the different emotions of life. And even as, as you were sharing this, like, this, this idea of, of burnout and, and feeling crispy and everything else, like the reality is our, our girls, like we've all gone as a family through that journey together. And what I think is going to actually pay some of the biggest dividends years in the future is how Al's modeled self-care in the last few years that would not have been as true even a, a decade ago, right? Yeah. Like like this, um, this finding her own space Space, finding her own voice, finding like the, the space in writing this book. Um, that has what's what's the I'm not I'm gonna get the quote wrong, but the um Maya Angelo quote of as you let your light shine, you Marianne Williamson. Marianne Williamson, as you let your light shine, you you allow everyone around you to let their light shine as well. And paraphrase. Um I, I've watched that happen. I mean, I think on a on a, the most basic level, like if I was seeing a word over Alice's head almost all the time, it would be connection or community or somewhere in that space. We went out to dinner with Brielle um, uh, about a week, week and a half ago, just Brielle, which is our, great. Our 10-year-old. And um, if anybody ever sees on, on Facebook or whatever, pictures of us at a restaurant with like a piece of paper and little thought bubbles, um, that's because... I take them to Matt's El Rancho and their paper uh, menus. menus. We turn it over and we'll always, we'll do something. So this time it was like, what are our core values? So we're asking Brielle, our 10 year old core values. And one of them was, um, you are welcome here, right? And I love that. Like you, you are welcome here. And it was, it was treating, making friends feel like family. Mm -hmm. I think mm. probably somewhere in that host space of making people feel like family has been a core value that I've watched Alice live out since I met her in our early twenties. Uh, by the way, most of your greatest um, successes, most of your greatest gifts come out of deep pain, right? And we could, we could dig into it on this call or not, but the reality is there's a bunch of tremendous pain around what you thought family was going to be, what it actually turned out to be, the the missing, like the the hole in the heart there, and then trying to figure out, all right, so it is what it is. This is this is my life. Now, how do I help others feel as welcome and as connected, even though the hurt in my own life is feeling disconnected? So I think I've watched you model that for the girls at a at a huge level. Um, I think Kristen might probably be a better person to answer, like how is how is she modeled it that way? Um, but I just want to add one quick word. Um, I think you actually, or I heard about the word and then I asked you and you're like, oh yeah, I totally talked to my therapist about that before. Liminal space. John, have you heard of this phrase liminal space? No. So I, I never heard of it. I just would have heard it as like when they talk about a guy uh, like, like going through the tunnel of life, right? Like this kind of, I've left here, I'm going here. It was your trapeze comment that made me think of it. And it's like, I watched Alice model over the past few years for your own self, what it is like to go through the liminal space, which I think the definition is like transitional period. I'll call it emotional transitional period. And um, it is scary as anything. Mm -hmm. mm. It, is, it absolutely is scary. And it, it reveals courage in a profound way. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about like trapeze, like we can all picture the trapeze artist, let go of this thing, grab that thing. But in the moment, or when you're first doing it, or where you feel like you're a trapeze artist without a net, that requires tremendous courage. And um, and and I think it's something that every every dad can relate to, every mom can relate to. It's why I'm in this group, right? Front Row Dads is the community that surrounds dads going through so many of life's transitions, right? I mean, we're we're surrounding each other with these with these bands for might be going through a career transition or our kids hit us uh, this age and that's a transition and, and it needing that community around you. And I just watch you go through this transition, keeping the family intact. Um, Another way to describe those liminal spaces is something that characterizes them is that they're very thin and mm. they're very fragile, which is part of what makes them really scary. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Carissa, did you read the book? Oh yeah, 
I think I was the first one to read it cover to cover. All right. So tell me, was there a part in there when you're like, yes, she nailed it. Like, that's it. That's exactly it. I'm so glad she wrote about that or told that story or used that example. Or was there a part of the book where you noticed yourself kind of coming more alive with a full body yes and alignment with what was written on those pages? Well, I think the thing that for me actually stuck out the most, and it's a little odd, is the page where it's um how to say no. And it's what, like 54 ways to say no. Uh, because <laughs> nice. for me, I struggle with that. And I get that from my mama. <laughs> uh, Everybody wants to buy the book now. <laughs> right? Right? Like the... And it's 54 ways that you can like say no. And like only one of them is actually saying the word no. But like just learning that for me, especially in the season that I'm in, like I'm not living at home. I do have to advocate for myself now and where I am and learn how to step into those conversations in the corporate world or wherever, but also like protecting my own space, guarding my time, uh, working with what my values are and aligning with those. And a lot of that is telling people no, sometimes more often than I'm saying yes to things, um, which is really scary. But for me, that page, actually, when I first picked up the physical copy of the book was one of the first things I turned to. Um, so it's not quite a story, but it was one of my favorite things that I got out of that book. That's beautiful. Um, Alice, how does it feel to like hear Carissa talk like that about the book? It's surreal. It's, um, I'm just so proud because it's like, oh my gosh, like she's like, she's talking and she's like the social proof. Yeah. Right. Like I, I get to, I, I get to feel really congruent. Yes. Yes. Um, it, so like, I, I've never done something that feels so authentic. Mm. Um, and she's just one of four, right? Like I could say that about any of our girls, like totally. all, all four of them would have been on the podcast if, you know, they weren't in school or weren't out of the country, right? Like, because they all, they all <laughs> yeah, by the kids. way, should we mention that one of your daughters <laughs> is currently in Nepal with my son? Like, how crazy is that? Yeah. Thanks. How crazy they yeah. went bungee jumping. Oh yeah. Off like a 500 foot bridge. <laughs> yeah I can't like I, I can't even like I, I love that the joke by the way was <laughs> that we had like a parent go we had two parents going and the guide of the school with the kids and then Tatiana goes I was really nervous until I found out that Laura Daly was going and then I was like it's fine <laughs> and, she's 17. <laughs> and she's 17 that's right she's 17 she's a minor too like we need to sign all the paperwork for her too like she can't just go that was it was th th that is a that's a great representation of how our family feels about your family um alice what what about the book now that it's it's out there and people are reading it and they're talking about it and you're getting feedback and reviews and all these things what are you delighted to hear well, I'm delighted in the interest of moms to want to know and be more. I'm so excited that moms are picking, because moms will pick it up because they want to help their kids, right? It's the, it's the traditional oxygen mask, like put your own oxygen mask on first. And the reason they actually, if you watch on a plane, like next time you're on a plane, go watch the number of times they will actually tell a parent with a young child. Like you hear them say it up front first, but if you are sitting with a young kid, they'll come up a second time and then oftentimes there's a different flight attendant that will come up and actually say it a third time. And the reason they do that is because they know, they know that as a mom, I'm going to make sure that the kid has the oxygen mask, has their shoes tied, has a snack, has a stuffed animal and a friend before we'll ever pick up our own. And I think it's just awaking this conversation of, um, oh my gosh, like, no, 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 like they, they don't get to live this life if, if I'm not here. And um, in the epigraph, I, I share a quote from Carl Jung that says, um, the greatest burden on a child is the unlived life of a parent. Hmm. And that one, that one quote has hmm. sparked so much conversation for moms of, wait, you mean that 
if I don't live a full life, that I'm putting a burden on my child. So it really flips that whole thing into, no, no, no. As moms, we need to live full lives. Like that is part of our responsibility to my girls. Like that's why I went and climbed Kilimanjaro in 2000, whatever, 15, 16. Like I wasn't like camping to me is like the holiday in. I like, so to me to go camping on the side of a mountain, like that's not like how I'm wired. It's not fun for me when it's like not one of those things that some people are really excited to go do. I, that wasn't my motivation. My motivation was I want to come home and tell four daughters, like, Hey, your mom can go do hard things. And if I can go do hard things, you can go do hard things. But I was going to model that for them. So I think all these conversations around, okay, mom, what is living a full life for you look like? Cause I don't think moms are talking about it because we're so busy eating the leftovers on the plates and being sleep deprived and not even taking time to go to like normal doctor's appointments or thinking that going or getting our hair cut is like a luxury when they're actually maintenance items. Like the things that we need to just maintain, we're not even doing for ourselves. Yeah. That's a really hard balance, isn't it? Between like, how much do you take care of yourself? How much do you adventure? How much do you live your own life? And then how much do you pour into your family? It's, I mean, in the most simple terms, it's how much are you out of the house versus in the house as an example. And it doesn't have to be that, uh, it doesn't have to be that way, right? It doesn't have to be. Either a, or, or both and thinking, right? Like, that's right. oh my gosh, well, do I do this or this? It's like, well, what if, what if there's an and instead? And then where exactly. does your partner come into play? Where does dad come into play in all of this in supporting those things because mom may want to do those things but does dad even know what are the conversations that are happening at home around what each of us needs um because moms don't talk a lot in terms of what needs and wants are for herself a lot we're, we're good with what do the kids want and need but like if we really look at our own health physical mental emotional all of those pieces, like what, what do we need? And then what are the conversations that happen here to make sure that mom's really full so that the kids can be all of those things? Yeah, John, you, you just mentioned like in the house, out of the house, and then like that word congruent you brought up earlier, a huge word for our family. I would say anytime that we feel like we are not being congruent or who we are uh, on a podcast isn't who we are behind the scenes. Anytime that's true, it's like time out. Mm -hmm. th this, this isn't how we operate. Um, I would, I understand that there's the principle in, in, uh, at work of like, bring your child to work day. And my heart goes out to anyone that if they try to bring their child to work more than one day a year, they get weird looks. I hope that, that everyone who's listening to this has the resources and the resourcefulness and the frame of mind that if they don't like how congruent work and home feels that that you can find ways to adapt and change it. But I realize I look back and every decision we've made around our, our working world has lined up in harmony. Not that it's always the same, but it is lined up in harmony with our home world. I mean, why did we start a business where we end up throwing a lot of parties at home? Because we wanted to teach our kids at a young age to interact with adults, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking of one where Carissa, we would have her man the table at the movie party where she would um, maybe check people in, right? So she, it's eye contact, it's it's everything else. And then she would collect um, the charity gifts from people like collect books for a local children's hospital and, and put them on the table because we, we, we just wanted her to learn at a young age that what it feels like to actually like be a part of, of building a charity. John, we, we made him listen to a podcast on how to shake hands. Do you know there's a 45-minute podcast on how to- Oh, poor Carissa. I <laughs> still so remember sorry. that Carissa, car is this a good time to talk about childhood trauma? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually literally remember being in the backseat of the car with that podcast going, and he'd pause it and be like, okay, what'd you learn from the last five minutes? And <laughs> all the things. Like, I remember that car ride, and I'm pretty sure I was like 10 years old. <laughs> Welcome to a normal day at the Daily Home. Yeah. Carissa is still yeah. covering that topic in therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know how you know a good handshake, right, Carissa? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's some adults who don't know how to shake a hand, and we'll we'll like joke. I'll like one of the things was like web to web, so the web between your 
thumb and your pointer finger should be touching the other person's web and I'll like just whisper I'm like they didn't go web to web like it's, <laughs> it's been web. almost a decade that's so funny that's so funny Alice what was uh when you looked at the when you read the, sorry when you wrote the book um what parts in there I'm just, I'm guessing here that you revealed some challenges some frustrations some difficulties some hurdles what share with us one of the most difficult moments pieces you know to write about in the book or where you where you really opened up ooh just one um i mean the big, the biggest one was um for us and this it's 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 so cool because like when you start talking about any one of these principles they all like feed into the other so for us it was 2018 2019 when i when i hit this wall it was like life isn't working the way that it is and i got to a place where i'd rather where i said i would rather take a match and burn it all down and start over than like live this inauthenticity that i'm feeling right now because i felt like i had started this business where we had built it up and that was our intention. I'm like, I felt like I built like a noose to hang myself with because I, I didn't know how to, <laughs> our clients are wearing t-shirts that say live where you love. And I'm like, I don't live where I love. Like I hate coming home. And it wasn't the physical home, but it was the, there was something about environment. And I never grew up in, in, a, in a, with anybody teaching me that my environment even mattered. It was like, well, this is where you grew up. Be grateful. And so balancing like gratitude with like, but I'm unhappy. And that caused a lot of issues. Like I, Seth asked me, he's like, are you sick of the business? Are you sick of Baltimore? Are you sick of the marriage? And I, my answer was yes. Mm -hmm. And those were some really hard days. And I'd love to say that it was just a couple of days, but it was a couple of years. And we really had to wrestle through hard conversations and our kids were there to see all of it. And we were really transparent. I mean, when there's fighting, like they know, like, so if you're in one of those seasons and you think you're keeping something from your kids, I guarantee you that you're not. So if you are in one of those seasons, I think one of the things you can actually lean into is kids are way smarter than we give them credit for. So engage them in more conversations. They don't need to know all of it yet. I think a lot of times we think we're keeping, we're protecting them by not sharing when I, and again, Carissa can speak to this, um, from your perspective, but I think we just modeled like transparency and, and honesty with like, Hey, we're going through a really hard time right now. And we know you guys see pieces of it and then reassuring them in areas too of like, Hey, but this, this isn't about our love for you, but sometimes adults go through really hard things. And so doing things that were age appropriate with each of them, cause they're, you know, now 19, 17, 13 and 10. Um, so this is going a few years back, but being age appropriate with them and, so sharing in the book, like, yeah, we're all going to go through that stuff, but then how do you design a life that you love? There's a discovery phase and there's a, a design phase of designing the life that you love. And I think we all love the design phase of like, oh, I'm going to create this life that I love. But in order to design it, you have to do some discovery work of, you know, hey, what's, what's the, what's the, what's the trauma that I need to go deal with? What's the stuff I need to go heal? Because whatever we, um, don't repair, we're going to repeat whatever trauma we don't decide to heal. It's going to pass down another generation. And that was a catalyst for a lot of it. It's like, dang, if I don't deal with this stuff, my girls are going to get it. So no, the buck stops with me. I want to, I want to deal with that stuff. So yeah. So I talk about a lot of that. Yeah. Carissa, from your perspective, having been part of a family that's so authentic, transparent, revealing, honest, right? It, talk to me a little bit about how you processed that. And, and maybe you could speak also to um, how you, how, what you learned, right? By watching your parents go through all these real hurdles, whether it be with their professions or moving or their marriage, right? Because I, I read magic mom. I don't read perfect mom. Mom did everything right. Mom with no regrets. Mom right? Mom who was happy every day in every moment, nailed everything perfectly, you know, by the book. So just talk to me a little bit about, you know, your experience of, of all that realness. 
Yeah, well, I am a very highly empathetic person, so I think I probably knew there was stuff going on, like, way early. I was probably super young, and, like, I remember I'd go up to my mom and be like, what's happening? Because I can feel it, like, physically, mm -hmm. um, and so that, like, 2018 to 2020 season was probably the two hardest years I think we ever had as a family, but it was also the catalyst to like changing everything. Um, Cause in 2018, we were all still in traditional school. I was a freshman in high school, pretty much dead set on like going to college, studying for the next 16 years and becoming a surgeon. Like I had my entire life mapped out my freshman year of high school because that's the school I was in. It was in a program to study medicine. Um, and so I knew that about myself and that's I thought we were just going to be here and we were going to keep going and that's what we were going to do um and then I kind of felt like everything at home was imploding um like didn't know like it really got to the point where I was like remember talking to someone and I was like I don't know if my parents are getting divorced this week but it feels like it's coming and it freaked me out and I was like it's so unstable it's shaky um and I can feel it my high empathy could definitely feel it um, but I also remember, like, I think my parents modeled how to fight well, if that's something you can do. Um, but just being authentic with the fact they never hid the fact that they were fighting. I always knew it was there. I always knew I knew that there was tension. And it was like, OK, we're all going to be in the kitchen. And sometimes disagreements happen in the kitchen. And we're just going to watch that happen. So I think they modeled like you don't have to fight behind the closed doors. And I could see the communication and I could see actually the communication patterns and where I get my communication from because I tend to lean like my mom and I shut down a little bit. I'm like, oh, I see where I get that from. And I just watched that happen in a conversation. Um, so we watched all that happen. And I think that was the year we switched to acting. Like, so not only was home different, but school was completely different, turned upside down my sophomore year of high school. And then I remember we had a family meeting one night and we had been floating the idea of Austin, I think for a while. Um, and I just told my parents, I was like, so we're either going to move this year in between my sophomore and junior year, or you're not going to move until I graduate high school. <laughs> And my mom had been talking about it for a while. And I kind of told them like, it has to happen this fall or it's not happening um, because I'm gonna refuse to leave between my junior and senior year, um, which is understandable. But I think that whole season of just what felt like chaos was the catalyst to get us to where we needed to be. Um, and ultimately to the healthiest place. It was just so uncertain for a long time. Um, but I think now, like even in seasons where I'm in right now, like I'm in between jobs right now and like, it feels a little shaky, but I've already been through that. So it's fine. I know I'll come back on the other side. That's a model that was instilled for me. Um, so I think that that having that experience will definitely shape going forward, how I deal with those seasons of uncertainty. I can't speak for all the listeners, but I'm imagining this right now that when you hear about new books, you can hear some podcasts and I'm not poking at them, but there's like a version of a podcast, which is like point number one in the book, point number two in the book. And it just goes through, right? That's one way to unpack information. Nothing wrong with that. But I also think there's power in just getting a real look into a family's inner, their, 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 the inner work, which is what we're getting now, the real story, the inner work, the actual, like, this is what's happened because it's really, to me, Alice, I'm gonna speak right to you with this, is like, it's inspiring for me to wanna read the book because I'm like, oh, this is rooted in realness. Yeah. This isn't just somebody who like, everything just unfolded perfectly. And they're like, you know, here's seven ways to be perfect. And it's just, <laughs> this is like, this has been tempered, right? This has been tested. This is chaos to creation. and. That to me is a far is an interesting story because it much more aligns with what I feel my life has been like, right? Like when you're talking about fighting and I, I remember this one time Tatiana and I were fighting and then I went into Tiger's room and had all this energy and I'm like, da, 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 da. he goes, listen, you're fighting with mom. You got all this big energy and you just brought that energy in here. You actually don't have a lot of big energy towards me. This is just residual from your stuff with mom. And I'm like, who are you? Like, 
Oh my gosh. When you hear your own words come back. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. So good. So good. And, and I'm like, you're right. <laughs> Damn it. You're right. Um, and I'm so grateful and sort of upset that you're smarter than me in this moment and that you're maybe more mature than I am. And I'm oh. feeling terrible and happy. Oh, yeah. Parenthood. Um, so deeply. my goodness. Yeah. Well, uh, Alice, let me throw you an open-ended question just to sort of give you the mic and say, look, your book is out there. You really worked hard on it. People are behind it. I'm really happy for you. What do you want to say about the book to the audience out there listening that hasn't been said? Open mic, anything you want to say, it's yours. It's a, it's a book not to tell you what to do, but to give you hope and new possibilities of way that your life and your family could be. So if you're feeling, if you're a mom who's feeling stuck, it's gonna open up some new ways to think about the way that you're living, the way that you're doing things and some, just some new avenues, right? Cause it's different models, ways to talk to ourselves, ways to affirm ourselves, ways that we need to give ourselves grace, ways to ask powerful questions because answers will come when we ask a different question and then see for coach, like, okay, we're so involved in coaching our kids, but who's coaching us? Where are we learning? Where are we growing? One of the principles that we've always lived by is the Mark Twain quote of never let your schooling interfere with your education, which is why that changed a lot of how we did stuff with our kids. But I think as adults too, it's like, well, there's also no schooling. So like, what are, what are we going to do? How are we learning? How are we growing? Um, so the book for me is just the start of a conversation. Um, so I think some really big things. So I just encourage people to pick it up. And yeah, I, it's so funny. I got some, some of the best compliments I got from the book have been like, one was from a divorced dad with a son who read it. Um, so again, the principles, the principles hold true. And I think for dads on this podcast, like for those of you that have wives that maybe aren't in any of these communities, read it together or have her read it, like whatever, but it, it will open up new conversations that I think will, will benefit the whole family. And would you say also that if a guy listening to this wants to buy it for his wife, I'm wondering if there's like a better way to give the gift, not like, cause there's one way that I could see you hand it to your spouse. Like, Hey, I think there's room for you to grow, but there's another way to hand it which could be, it's true for all of us, right? That yeah. may be a true statement, but it could be like, hey, uh, I don't think you're doing a good enough job. So here, why don't you read this and do better? But maybe maybe the invitation is to hand it to them and say, I think you're doing such an amazing job as a mom. I admire you so much that when I heard about this, I just thought that you might align with another mom who's doing such an amazing job. And you know, I is that more of the spirit do you think if a guy is, I mean, here, just coach I'll, us I'll men here a little bit on how we I'm might tell you this. Exactly. I'm going to give you the softball. Here's, here's how you, here's how I'm you right pitch it. Cause it's, it's entirely true. And, and it's a premise of the book is that we talk about entrepreneurship as taking initiative um, where there's great risk is what entrepreneurship is. There is no greater entrepreneur on the planet than a mother. It is initiative. And it is the greatest risk to bring a child into the world. And so this book is for an entrepreneurially minded mom, which really are all moms because you don't bring a child into the world if you're not willing to take on a little bit of risk. And hey, you're doing such a great job at this. And I would love more of this for our family. Yeah. Seth, any final words from you, buddy? Oh my gosh. Well, going back to what, I've just listened to that conversation with Carissa and Alice, and I realized, uh, so Alice climbed Kilimanjaro. Uh, every mom out there, every family out there has had their Kilimanjaro moments mm -hmm. where you did something, you went through something that was not easy at the time. Uh, it was hard to breathe. Um, you got on the other side of it and you realized that you are stronger and more resilient than you ever thought. And, and that can be true at an individual level, that's definitely true at a family level. I mean, John, you've, you've shared stories even recently, right? Where as a couple, like your marriage, 
went through something and came out on the other side of it. And like, we are stronger than we thought. And how often do we as, as this whole ecosystem need to remind each other that the reality is family stuff is hard. Like this is hard. Like right before we hopped on this podcast, the three of us were talking, Carissa, Alice, and I, we're talking about some hard stuff that she's going through right now. Like, yeah, like this is like entrepreneurship. I, I have that, that that joke of like, we go interview people on the podcast, we'll have guys come to the retreats that are like, yeah, this guy had a had an exit from a business and it was a seven figure exit and everything else. I'm like, so Alice um, just had an exit uh, of a business she's been launching for the past 18 years. Uh, she exited that business. It's definitely like an eight figure exit. That business then moved to Tulsa and her name is Carissa. And she's got three more businesses she's about to launch, you know, cascaded now. Um, the reality is like what we guys will get on these podcasts or, or, or be in these communities. And it's like, because we can attach dollar figures, <coughs> right? These are businesses. And because we can attach dollar figures, somehow we think that our personal growth is, is worth more or it's more tangible or anything else. The reality is what all of us are passing on, what all of us are passing on are, is this legacy of this next generation. And we, we want to create them to be as resourceful as possible. We want to give them every strength that we thought we brought into the world. We want to help them uh, avoid every weakness. That never happens, but we, we want to do the best job we can as parents. I think every parent out there wants that. And along the way, we lose hope. And if we lose hope, it's because we've lost some perspective, maybe some systems, right? Magic is just a system, but then we've also lost community. And that's where I think, um, what, what I watch you do in person and what I hope that this allows you to do, allows our daughters to do is, is to help foster the community around for, for moms to talk about these topics because the work you're doing in the world is amazing. And the work we're doing as families are amazing. So. Yeah. Carissa, anything you want to say about your mom and her new book? I mean, I love her. She's my best friend. And this book is seriously, I mean, we've watched it. All four of us have watched it be written for the last five years. Um, so it wasn't, it was not a, it was not a fast process. It was something that was slow. And I know that uh, was really just a journey. It literally brought our families through up and downs and um, it was constant. And so I'm really excited that it's, actually finally out because it's everything you know once you'd lock the door and be like I'm writing for an hour it's like okay I just lost my mom for an hour but now to see the fruit of everything that she's been working on and like being on her webinars and like listening for her visions for the future with the book and hearing how many lives that that's going to impact it's like okay that hour was nothing like it gets to impact so many more people um so I'm really proud of her and I'm really excited to see where it goes Beautifully said. Um, Seth, Alice, and Carissa, thank you for being here. And lots of love to your other girls who were not here, although we would have enjoyed a conversation with them as much. Of course, they would have added to the quality of this conversation. And we'll have future conversations, I know, um, because community is a focus for all of us. Uh, I hope everybody goes out and picks up a copy of the book. It's available on Amazon. We'll link to it in the show notes. Magic Mom. And not don't just get one copy, get two and share it with somebody else outside your family as well. And then once you read it, leave a nice review because for an author, that is one of the best things is to read the impact that the book has had on you. So please leave Alice a nice review. And thank you guys for listening to this show. Thank you to the ladies out there who've listened to this show. And perhaps men, if you've heard this episode, you could pass this along to your wives or to somebody in your world that you think is an amazing mom and say, I heard this show with an incredible mom who wrote an incredible book. And I thought of you knowing how much you love being a mom or how much you care about being a mom. So pass along the episode as well. There's lots of ways to support this, but you know, Seth, you said it in, in a, in a in the perfect way, which is if we can spark conversations, if we can create intention and presence in our thought and in our physical beings with our families, if we can show up, if we can know that we're not alone in going through the chaos and the difficulties as we climb our own mountains, then um, a lot of times it's just knowing that we're not alone and that uh, we're doing this together. It's one foot in front of the other. 
And uh, the, the journey, um, you know, so much of it, we don't know what's ahead. We don't know what's coming our way, right? We don't know what the future holds. One minute we think we're going to be a surgeon and the next minute we're not even doing school and we're moving to another state. And then we're living over here on the East Coast. Then we're living in Texas. And then we're, right, it's like, it's, there's so many things that are just unknown. But if we can lock arms with people we love, if we can pour into our families, if we can learn to forgive them, to forgive ourselves, to keep finding the most authentic, best versions, um, we'll all be better off. So glad that we're doing life together, guys. Love you all. And thanks for being here today. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.